morning everybody. It's the 10th of September 2020 and I am reading Prelude to the Landing on Planet Earth. It is a book written by Stuart Holwright and it's published in 1975. This is a story of three people, uh, the main characters of this book, which I consider true. <laughs> uh, a doctor, Puharich, his name is Dr. Puharich, and Sir John Whitmore and Phyllis Schlemmer, who is a medium from America. And they met uh, through many synchronicities, and this journey has been fascinating. We are now in March 1975, and they had an incident with a car, uh, because Sir John Whitmore was a waste racing driver in he usually drove too fast and um, the Council of Nine had to help them not to have an accident. So, I'm ending the finish, I'm finishing the chapter eight this morning. There was nothing obviously wrong with the wheels or the tires of the car when they examined them the next morning, but John drove slowly and with great caution nevertheless. The three of them talked frankly about the previous night's communication and the understandings and feelings that they... No. No. I'm so sorry. I read that first part of chapter five, uh, chapter eight. <laughs> okay, part three of Walking on Eggs. I'm not gonna do this again now. Page 293. I thought it sounded familiar. Anyway, they had a problem with the car, so we'll had the third, second part of chapter 8 and this is the third part of chapter 8. I apologize. I don't know about my readers but I need to take a breather at this stage. This really made last, this ready made last chapter of the present narrative which seems to be plotted and structured like a stage play or a movie scenario is leaving even me, leaving even me breathless and incredulous as it unfolds. I mean if it isn't literally true, whose fantasy is it? If it's invention, then the intelligence that invented it had an extraordinary endowment of dramatic skills, knew how to build up a denouement, denouement <laughs> progressively through a series of episodes, how to create suspense, how to plot and lay foundations for future developments. And there's another staggering thing I've just discovered. The ending of this book was foreseen by Tom in December 1974, some 15 months before I began to write this, and four months before the events recounted above. At that time, the intention was that Andritja should write the book, and in, in a communication on the 5th of December 1974, part of which I have reported above, pages 209 and 10, he discussed with Tom some of the problems he was having. having. He said, Andreja, right now I'm looking at a huge pile of rubble and trying to create an edifice out of it. I really don't know where to start, in what order to pick up the stones, what form and shape to give it. I know how he felt, but Tom had a simple answer to that. May we say to you, Doctor, that you have within you the nature of a ring of truth and that is all that is necessary. So he should tell the story straightforwardly and just as it had happened. But what about the ending? Andreja asked, I'd like to have your advice as to where the first publications and the report of the first series of your communications should include in order to set the stage for the next series of events. What would be a kind of climatic ending that, in effect, would whet the appetite for more knowledge. Tom, Tom's answer didn't seem particularly exceptional at the time, but in the light of what we know now about events and considering how this book has taken shape and approached its maximum possible length at this stage of the story, it is quite an amazing answer. Tom. In the months of February of your coming year, 
75. Towards the end of that month, it will be necessary for the three of you to return to this nation of Israel. You will return and we know, you know not, but we know, that you, with your presence, will avert another attempt of war. And you may then, if you desire, end your war on that particular note. Though Tom was two weeks out, as their intended departure for Israel in February was delayed by the interpersonal difficulties, difficulties they were going through at that time, what an uncanny prediction it is, and what a felicitous sense of literary structure it shows. And so, to the final scene of the drama, which appropriately contains suspense, villainy, miracle, the resolution of this particular climateric and intimate intimations of future developments. On April the 1st, 75, Tom gave them a summary of the consequences of the previous night's events. Tom, at this time, there's great confusion in the nations that oppose the nations of Israel. There's contact between the nation across from where you are and the nation of Soviet Russia. There is great disturbance because the Syrians are blaming the Russians for the bad missiles. It will create a difficulty in two ways. Yes, Andreja said, I imagine the Syrians will blame Russia for sabotaging their plans with poor equipment and the Russians will blame the Syrians for not knowing how to operate it properly. Tom, yes, at great cost, there will be more shipments, but when it has happened, two or three times, they may begin to understand what really happened. Andretta asked, so may we assume that we're safe now, until the third of this month you are in? Yes, you mentioned the third and the mopping up of the fringes last night. John said, can you give us some idea of the kind of thing our energy will be required for on the third? John, uh, Tom, Sir John, there is a plan to take you, our doctor, and our being on a visit by the use of where you are. It would be of benefit because it is closer to where you need to be. We would have you understand that it is only the nation of Syria that we will be concerned with at that time. It was true that the young man they had befriended, Israel Carmel, had proposed that he and a friend of his named Gideon should take them to see an interesting natural phenomenon known as the Hexagon Pools in the former Syri ter Syrian territory of Golan, and a date suggested for this trip was the 3rd of April. Israel had thought that this trip was his idea, but now it seemed that it was an idea that the management had planned and planted as a part of their advanced planning. They received no further details of the plan in this communication and when they attempted to communicate the following day, a most unexpected thing happened. Phyllis was unable to get into a deep trance. She got down to a certain level where she came up against some sort of blockage and was subjected to a psychic attack. She described the experience to John and Andreja and they discussed it with her. I was going in and this fire was burning all around me. Villages were being burned and I thought I was in a situation like Africa. I saw these burning villages and I saw skin being peeled off people and all sorts of stuff. But I can handle that because it's like I'm an outside observer. Then, all of a sudden, all these thing, kind of things are coming at me and they're pulling at my tongue and at my eyes and they're biting me and sticking things into me. And they're the ugliest things I've ever seen. I've been in prehistoric, I have been in prehistoric times, but they are worse than prehistoric. Then they turn to human and their eyes are red and they laugh at you. And I can't get past that level. I can't get to the nine. John said, well, the management have warned us that the opposition and the others and the cabal would try to stop our communications and would try to do so by creating a fear. Phyllis said, fear is one thing, John. I can rationalize in my mind, this can't hurt me, it's an illusion, okay? When I go down there and see all these things, I can say to myself, it's an illusion, it's a nightmare, they can't do anything to you. But when they start ripping at you and it hurts, that's another thing. Andreja, yes, that's when they're getting at your etheric 
and it's dangerous. And where are the nine? cried Phyllis with a note of exasperation. Wait a minute, John said. As I see, the opposition believe that if they can prevent our communication, then they can make us ineffective. So, shouldn't we just go ahead and do tomorrow what we know or think is the right thing to do and not worry too much about holding this communication, particularly in view of the risks involved? Andretta agreed in principle, but he said he thought they should try once more. This was the first time that the opposition had succeeded in blocking communication, and, it was, and he was worried that there might be a reason for it. Perhaps the opposition wanted to prevent them getting information that would be important for tomorrow. So they tried again, and this time Phyllis managed to get out. Sorry, this is storage. So they tried again, and this time Phyllis managed to get out of her etheric envelope, secure from the depredations of the creatures of the opposition, and in due course, Tom made his presence known. His visit was brief, though, and his message was urgent. There is within the best spares. There is within the spheres of battle that is creating difficulty. We can stay but for a moment. It is important for you to know that on your morrow there will be an attempt by those across the water from where you are to send destruction by poison. It is important that it be stopped. You will go where you plan to go. We must leave now. They got more details at nine o'clock the following morning when communication was established without any problem. Between the hours of four and six, Tom said, those that are across intend to create illnesses for the people of Israel by poisoning. It is important that you continue your plan to go within the reach of the nation of Syria and meditate. It is the anger of those that had a failure, and it is not done by the heads of the nation, but by those that are fanatical. We cannot permit this destruction, but we need your physical energy to cause a neutralization. As we have explained to you before, with enough series of failures, those that oppose will begin to see the light. Explaining the difficulty they had had in communicating the previous evening, Tom gave an interesting comment on the subject of Armageddon. In your physical world, when there is a war, there are portions of that war that remain in the mind. Portions that are memorials to freedom and also memorials to slavery. What, has, what was happening last evening was one of those memorials. It was partly a physical battle, but it was more of a mental power struggle for the gaining of the minds. You understand that in this battle you call Armageddon, the important thing is to gain control of the souls and the minds? Which prompts a brief digression. Several of the present day awareness, psychologies and techniques maintain that man is kept in confusion and his development is retarded by what they call but what they call uncleared engrams, i.e. residual memories or emotions from earlier stages of life or from former lives. Tom seems to be saying much the same in this passage, and I think the idea helps us to make sense of the concept of the Battle of Armageddon, particularly if we can recall also that thought, and therefore memory, is an energetic field phenomenon. Getting back to the subject of the day's work, Tom said that they should make Phyllis fully aware of the situation, and that if they alerted her that there was danger at any time, they should all flee like deer. Tom said, it is unfortunate that we must send you where we are sending you, for you to be as close as possible for this particular situation, but we cannot afford to have any error. It must be completely neutralized. It cannot be merely a portion neutralized. It must be turned to pure water. Do you understand? Yes, Andretta said. Could you give us some idea what the nature of the toxin is? Tom said, I do not understand chemistry, but uh, he consulted briefly with Altia and then continued. They have explained that it is of a viral nature that will work in slowly until it would be too late to recognize what had happened. Yes, I understand, said Andretta. A virus with a slow incubation period. Do you know how long that incubation period would be? Tom, they say between three and seven of your day. And presumably the plan is to release this material into the water somewhere so that it pollutes the Lake of Galilee. Yes. 
So it's a thing that can be done by one person surreptitiously by two. Fun. Uh, by two. To get to the hexagon pools, you take a rough truck off a main road in the Golden Hills and follow it for about three miles as it winds up and round a hillside. Then you have to scramble for 15 minutes down a steep path into a narrow gorge and all the time as you descend the sound of rushing water gets louder. At the bottom of the gorge there is, geolo there is geological enigma. It is a rocket, rocky place and all the rocks are hexagonal. You stand on a natural platform which is a mosaic of hexagons, each about 18 inches across and and see identical shaped rocks below and all around you. There is a large pool in which the water cascades over the hexagonal rocks and the sheer cliff face that rises from it is ripped with profusion of hexagon shaped outcrops like stalactites, stalactites and stalagmites. The whole is one of the nature's most impressive sculptures. This was the place that their Israeli friend brought John, Phyllis and Andretta uh, to the af in the afternoon of the 3rd of April. Israel and Gideon knew nothing about the dramatic background of the trip. However, they knew about their eccentric friend's habit of sitting in meditation with their feet in water for 15 minutes every afternoon. And when they had done, and when they had all done admiring and commenting on the scene, and John said it was time for the meditation, the Israelis took off their shoes and socks as well. This created a dilemma, which John and Andrija discussed in private for a minute. They had formed the idea that their presence was needed in this particular spot at this time, because it was the water of this stream which went into Galilee that was going to be poisoned, and that by sitting in meditation with their feet in the stream, they would be able to neutralize it. But what, they wondered, would happen if some of the stuff remained active, and they got it on their feet. It was perhaps a minimal risk, but was it but was it one they would let could let others take unwittingly? John was doubtful, but Andretcher was of the opinion that they could trust the management to look after everything and certainly shouldn't allow any doubts to jeopardize their work at this time. So the two Israelis joined them in their meditation, unaware of any possible dangers. The water was pretty cold and after 15 minutes their feet were numb. They had to massage the life back into them. Did you get anything, Phyllis? John asked, for often her clairvoyance in meditation tied in significantly with what they later discovered had happened. Phyllis said that she had got something, but she would have to tell them later. When they were alone, just the three of them back at the Galle Kinneret, they compared notes and agreed that at the time of the meditation and after, they had all felt quite depleted of energy. That was probably a sign of their energies had been effectively channeled. Phyllis' vision also suggested that they had. She had clearly seen two people dressed as Bedouin in a field near a stream. One was dressed as a woman, but she knew by the vibration that it was a man disguised. They were going towards two canisters which had just been dropped from a helicopter. They got to where the canisters lay and were going to pick them up when suddenly the canisters dematerialized. The Arabs were in consternation. They gesticulated and shouted at each other and rushed about the place searching for the vanished canisters. Phyllis said she felt quite sorry for them for they could pick up the fear they had of going back to their leaders and having to say they had lost the canisters. They would probably pretend they had done the job, she surmised, and hoped that some other explanation, why it wasn't successful, would be found. The information Tom gave them when they held the communication at nine o'clock that evening seemed to confirm that Phyllis's vision was in essential correct. You have upon this day completed, he said. You have upon this day completed, Tom said, though not in the minds of those that oppose, for it will take a few days for them to realize that there is no consequence for the poison in the water. What you have done this day was a necessity, 
because in their blindness and ignorance, those that oppose would not have caused destruction and disease in this nation of Israel, but in other nations too. It would have caused contamination of their own waters and of that of the nation of Jordan. You are dealing with those that are not of great mental capacity, but only have an anger and hate and emotions without reason. Yes, Andreja said, and what actually happened this afternoon? Did you successfully neutralize the toxin? It did not even enter the water. Did you in fact dem dematerialize the containers and the poison? Tom, yes. That is the reason there is weakness in the three of you, and particularly in the being Phyllis. It is now important that you rejuvenate your physical bodies. It is important for the blending that you rebuild your etherics. They may, he went on, now take a short break to attend to their personal affairs, but they should be back in Israel together within two weeks in April. There was a great deal to be done in the months ahead. Andreja asked if they might just summarize the various work projects. There was Altia's communication transmission project, which he understood was a long-term project that would begin with radio and television reception of anomalous at signals and pictures. Then there was the work of communicating the message of the Nine to the world at large and particularly to the nation of the nation of Israel. Thirdly, there was the work of contacting and helping children with paranormal powers. There was healing work in an area in which Phyllis had been increasingly engaged and there was to produce some impressive and that was some impressive results in the months ahead. Then there was the dolphin communication project. Tom said, yes, but war must be the first of your priorities. It is important for you to keep in your mind and heart the seriousness of the situation in the nation of Israel. As we have explained to you, you must spend most of your time here until the end of your month of July 75. For if July can pass without a war in this nation of Israel, it will be the ending of all wars. This was the most impressive of all Tom's predictions, for at the time it was made it was made Arab Israeli relations for at the time it was made, Arab Israeli relations were just about as bad as they had ever been, and a peaceful settlement of their difficulties seemed a very remote possibility. However, by mid-July 75, Egypt and Israel were each willing to make some concessions, concessions. And in August, Dr. Kissinger was able to announce that as a result of the negotiations of the past few weeks, the Sinai Agreement was virtually concluded and all that remained was the dotting of the I's. In the 18 months that have elapsed between then and the time of this writing, not only has there been no fresh outbreak or serious threat of war, but there has also been a discernible improvement of relations between Israel and the Arab world. During these 18 months too, the communications and the work of Andreja, John and Phyllis have continued, but that will have to be another story, for it is as long, as complex and as eventful as the one this book has told. Uh, there is a chapter 9 which is entitled Anatomy of a Mystery and I will read that separately because um, I've kept it quite sequential. This is the ending of chapter 8, prelude to the landing of planet Earth. Have a good day.